ICR Bulletin Podcast, the show where we examine the latest trends affecting radiology. I'm your host, Chris Hobson, and today I'm joined by Christoph Wald, MD, PhD, MBA, FACR. Dr. Wald is chair of the Department of Radiology at Leahy Hospital and Medical Center in Boston, and also serves as chair of the ACR Commission on Informatics. Dr. Wald, it's a pleasure speaking with you today. Pleasure to be here, Chris. Thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. Uh, The topic of today's conversation is artificial intelligence, which is a topic that's of interest uh, to a wide range of of people and and radiologists in particular. Um, And and today, I'd really love to talk to you about how you all have integrated AI into your workflow. So let's go ahead and dive right in. Um, Within the past few years, your department, Alehi, has integrated AI algorithms uh, that, when combined with workflow orchestration software, have helped uh, the radiologists in your group prioritize potentially critical imaging findings. I was wondering if you could just tell me a little bit about how this uh, overall has improved patient care. Yeah, so Chris, before I go into the specifics of how this improves patient care, let me just take a step back um, and just set the stage for for our discussion. Absolutely. So one thing I'd like to share with 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 the audience is that, um, and we may take this for granted today, but I, I sort of lived across the analog times of radiology as well as now the digital times, and I just want to state very clearly that radiology is really the first truly digital specialty in medicine. Everything that we do is digital. Um, our operational transactions, scheduling, and then carrying out exams is digital in the radiology information system. Uh, Every time we take an image of a patient nowadays, at least in this country, that's digital. Now, what does that mean? It means that the substrate of what we do, the imaging information that we've just generated, is immediately available for post-processing, for moving it around to the point of care, for immediately viewing it, uh, whether it's the radiologist or the clinician looking at, at this imaging study. And because it's digital information, it's also um, consumable by computers. And with that, everything that we do can actually be exposed to artificial intelligence algorithms. Hmm. Um, when, when these really first started showing up on the scene uh, you know, several years ago, uh, our department um, thought that it was really important to, to get to know this technology, you know, what we fully expect it to be really transformational for the practice of radiology. And for that reason, we just wanted to get our hands on it. So when we first put in this technology, it wasn't so much because we had a burning platform of a clinical problem that we couldn't possibly solve without AI. It was sort of a little bit of both. There was a promise of AI, which I will go into in a moment, of what it would do for our patient care. But there was also this curiosity and, and sort of the expectation that, that this was going to be a transformational event in, in imaging, like the arrival of a new modality on the scene. You know, when MR got onto the scene, that's probably the last uh, uh, major modality that has arrived. That was one of those transformational events. And I think we're, we're at, at a similar pivot point for our profession. Now, to your question, you know, how has it helped us you know, in, in patient care? The, f- the first set of algorithms that we put in um, were really CAD T FDA cleared algorithms. What that means was the purpose of determining whether a finding was present or absent was made to then triage the urgency of a case uh, for the radiologist to then interpret it. So that, has actually held up quite nicely. So during times of the week, uh, when our radiologists are challenged to keep up with the work volume that they're presented with, so specifically at nighttime, so between, you know, 10 and 2 a.m., when the emergency room is hopping and the the beds are full in the hospital and and we've got very few radiologists in, in the department, that's when it becomes really important for technology to help the radiologists direct their attention to the most urgent studies. And you know, that, that's typically the study where, we, where, where, where there might be a finding present. So it's extremely helpful for the AI to look at the study first and say, hey, look at this study first, it's most likely positive. And then that's what our radiologists do. So, so we found that um, that triage function helps during times when there's a mismatch between work and radiology capacity. Now, even though these algorithms were cleared for triage, they do perform a diagnostic task. So as a 
collateral to that, you actually essentially gain a second look over the shoulder. So uh, there are certainly instances when we as radiologists have not made very subtle findings, per, perhaps of a peripheral segmental pulmonary embolus, uh, which the software detects. And then sometimes it goes the other way around, you know, we detect something that the software didn't see or the software sees something, but we determine it's an artifact. So there's this, this is a little bit sort of a back and forth between you, the reader and the software, but that's another sort of, um, I think, positive impact on, on how we practice. You essentially have the second look over the shoulder. I just want to remind everyone, especially with the CAD T cleared uh, AI, that's really not what it was cleared for the diagnostic purpose. You know, it was really cleared to help triage, not to help automate diagnosis making. So hopefully it gives you a little bit of an idea at night and at the weekends when there's that mismatch, we're able to direct our attention to the most urgent cases more quickly. Yeah, that triage function and the the look over the shoulder, as you put it, um, that ju just to let the, the listeners know, um, that that was the subject of an imaging 3.0 case study we wrote yeah. a, a few months ago, with, and you were gracious enough to to um, collaborate on that. And I will go ahead and put a, a, a link to that in the show notes for today's Great. show. So, so yeah. to get the fuller picture of that. So mm -hmm. in, in the scenario that you've outlined, and, and I'm sure scenarios to come, uh, the, you know, it seems like the AI is playing a very supportive role, uh, which I guess you would have to say is in contrast uh, to the message that we often see in the media when it comes to AI, you know, taking over jobs in general, and, and also how they're supposed to be, you know, it's supposed to be poised to take radiologist jobs in particular. Um, you know, am I right in, in saying there's a kind of a contrast there? I, I mean, you, you, you already heard from my story that, you know, at least in our practice, we don't see AI as a threat. It, it assists the radiologists in, in doing their job more efficiently or prioritizing their work more appropriately. Uh, you also have to remember that, um, that well, let me start differently. In, in, in the US and in the past, uh, the ACR has struggled to make uh, accurate predictions about whether we have the appropriate workforce for the future. Uh, I, I see the intensity of imaging utilization only go up with, you know, if you look at the population pyramid, um, the baby boomers are aging into the high consumption years of, mm -hmm. of medical uh, care. And since imaging is involved in the majority of medical care, I can only imagine uh, imaging utilization to go up. Mm -hmm. At the same time, there are extreme cost pressures. You know, CMS has continually decreased uh, payment to radiologists in, 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 in the recent past, and, and that trend seems to continue. So there's going to be more work at less pay for hypothetically the same or fewer radiologists. Mm -hmm. uh, we haven't really changed the numbers at which we uh, graduate uh, radiology resident dramatically. So I think that there will be significant production pressures for radiologists and, and also access to imaging care um, concerns for patients. So how do we solve for that? I would argue that any technology that can make me faster, uh, prioritize my work better, potentially assist me in, uh, in either making diagnoses or assist me in some of the uh, diligence work that needs to happen. So if I have to measure five metastases, well, if, if a software can measure them for me and I can just report on that, uh, that makes me more efficient. So th those things are going to be critical for radiologists to continue to provide access to imaging care for patients going forward in that environment that I've just described. So I, I really don't see this as a, as a threat. I see this almost as a nece necessary um, um, tool that we're all going to need to incorporate to 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 sort of meet the demand. Yeah, it's interesting that you've cast it in terms of radiology, and that that's uh, you know for good purpose. But you know, back in 2018, when you all began introducing the AI algorithms AI algorithms into your workflow, um, you just de you decided to ask the uh, for referring provider input. Um, so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about you know, why you brought the refers into that decision-making process about which algorithms to actually work with. Hey, thank you for that question. You hit on a really important aspect and that's the, um, the need for imaging departments to really understand what our clinical customers need and, and, uh, and expect from us. So uh, to that particular point, um, right around the time that you're making reference to, uh, we were going to become a comprehensive stroke center 
And in gearing up towards this, we looked at best practices and noticed that the majority of stroke uh, revascularization trials had incorporated a particular AI, uh, which claimed to be able to sort of distinguish dead brain from recoverable brain and, and, and so forth, and also include perfusion analysis. Uh, that at the time seemed like the right thing to do then, because you know if it worked well in the trials and there was evidence to support that, uh, we really certainly wanted to follow that, that precedent. Now, what, what was good in our practice and what I would recommend to other members is we had sort of established ourselves at our institution as the go-to people um, for making such requests and then for us to, to be recognized as partners and, and honest partners who would, would, who would work with the clinical team to, to address their needs. I think as practicing radiologists in various practice settings, it really behooves all of us to, to work towards that end and sort of be the go-to people. I think it is, it is important for all of you to remember that the C-suite, whoever are the decision makers in your institution, recognize you in this role. So you have to make sure that, that in your department, there are at least one or several people who are a little bit fluent in, in you know, the clinical application of machine learning so that they get consulted when these projects come up. The last thing you want to have happen is that a clinical service contracts uh, without your knowledge uh, for an AI, and then you get landed with implementing it without, without having any say in the vendor selection and, and sort of selection of the right architecture. So I, I think radiologists need to get ahead of the game. A critical mass of them needs to become fluent uh, in at least the basics of, of clinical AI implementation, and then message that to the decision makers and to your clinical customers so that if and when they're tempted to consider putting something like this in, you're at the table and, and you can sort of influence the decision-making, the pace and the choice of product. Well, you talk about vendor selection and I mean, it sounds like, you know, instead of working in-house with data scientists at Leahy, you all decided to collaborate with an outside vendor on developing these AI tools. I guess without going into too many specifics or details, uh, can you tell me about the process of teaming up with a vendor, uh, in part particularly in light of, the, of how important it is to protect patient information? Yeah, I, I think, let me make a fundamental statement first. So for the vast majority of us, including my own department, um, making our own AI is sort of beyond the scope of what we do. We just don't have the core competence in-house. We certainly don't have uh, data scientists. And it also raises the specter of, do you really want to make software that is a medical device that you then use on your patients, even if it's within the walls of your own institution? What level of of clearance do you want, you know, before you feel comfortable using that. Some institutions actually have gone as far as to say, if, if we build anything in-house that we use only in-house, we want it to, to meet the same bar as FDA clearance. So I think for the vast majority of us, that's just simply not achievable. So what do you do? You basically orient yourself towards an ever-growing number of commercial offerings. Uh, the American College of Radiology actually has created a resource, AI Central, uh, which helps members, customers navigate this uh, growing space. I believe at, the, at this point in time, there's about 150 or so uh, and rapidly growing number of commercially available algorithms. Um, many of them do similar things. So you're absolutely um, left with a choice which vendor to go with. Uh, I would encourage you to... Um, talk to colleagues who have already put these systems in, talk to the vendors themselves, inquire about the architecture, find out what, um, what your IT security department is comfortable with. There are solutions that live entirely behind your firewall. And then there are other uh, solutions that uh, you know, have a so-called edge device. So a local server that sends information up to the cloud. Uh, you just have to figure out what is acceptable for your particular environment and then, and then go along with that. Um, I would say that it is important to get a sense for whether the vendor is willing to listen uh, and, and, you know, to what degree they come across as credible. Um, these are people you're going to partner with on your own patient care. So uh, thankfully, there are now choices and, um, you know, an ever-growing number of potential vendors. 
One way to make this a little bit easier is you can also go to so-called uh, platform companies or marketplaces, AI marketplaces. There are several out there. I won't mention any particular names, but if you contract with a marketplace vendor, that then gives you a single contract vehicle and a single platform, technically, and then you can more or less turn on or off one or several algorithms without having to write separate contracts and stand up separate servers. So that, that offers you several options um, for, for making good choices. Number one, you can turn algorithms on or off. Most of these vendors offer you a pilot phase where you can try something out. Uh, some of the vendors, uh, I saw that at the recent RSNA, uh, have even integrated tools into their platforms that allow you to record the performance of these AIs and, and sort of, you know, essentially do some acceptance testing or even comparison of performance, one versus the other. So I, I think marketplaces are some attractive, um, you know, options for someone who doesn't want it just sort of contract with individual AI companies or someone who wants to try out multiple similar functionalities uh, without too, too much uh, technical heavy lifting. Excellent. I'll see if we can put a link to that AI central um, <clears throat> resource you mentioned in our show notes as well yeah. to help people, uh, fig, fig, you know, navigate these choppy waters. Yeah. Um, well, it seems like in the process of working with the vendor and, and uh, like you just outlined, it seems like you kind of worked uh, over time to simplify the user interface such that users can get re results from the algorithms in a minimal number of clicks. And I was wondering why you all thought that functionality was important. Yeah, I think I think in general with technology, usability drives compliance, meaning if you make it really easy to use, people will come and use it. Um, with, with AI, I think that's new to our workflow. That's particularly important. Uh, so if you want your radiologist to benefit from, uh, from what the AI has to offer, you got to show them the AI result in context with their regular workflow. If they have to dig for it and log into a separate system and a separate viewer, and you know, it can get tricky and, and it may just get ignored. So your investment really does not get leveraged. Um, most radiologists are totally inundated with information on the many screens that we sit in front of. So uh, again, incorporating this to the degree possible and only showing the absolute necessary information in context with the study that we're reading only when, we're, when we need to look at it is sort of a way to, to, um, to make this manageable for, for the practicing radiologists and not to create incremental fatigue you know, or, or information overload. Uh, also remember that um, when you put these things in the first time, um, arguably at the very beginning and optimally for the entire sort of life cycle that it's in your department, you really do want to capture also some feedback from the radiologist, how well the, te the technology is working, how well it's checking out with what radiologists thinks going on. You can either do that by requiring them to, you know, click a button, agree, or something to that effect, or you can try to automate it. Uh, so in other words, you can grab the radiology report after the fact and see whether it checks out with what the AI thought was going on. Uh, there's definitely a growing sophistication in the automation of this sort of monitoring of performance. But to go back to the user interface question, whichever one you choose, by making it simple, people will actually do it. And so you'll get the information that you're looking for. Absolutely. And kind of staying on that assessment piece you just touched on, you know, as good as these algorithms are, um, they're going to sometimes report false negative, uh, sorry, false positive findings. Um, so to combat this, uh, you all worked with the vendor to incorporate a feedback loop into the system that, that actually tracks how well the algorithms perform over time. So how is this type of feedback beneficial to the radiology department and maybe to the adoption of, of these algorithms? I, I think... Um, one thing that everybody needs to realize is um, the, these algorithms, these software, software as a medical device is a little bit different from traditional medical devices. When, when traditional medical devices are cleared by the FDA, you know, they're obviously cleared for safety and, and adverse events. Uh, and typically, if it's a machine, uh, let's take an imaging machine as an example, it will work as intended almost all of the time, provided that you operate it correctly. Um, that may not necessarily be the case with software as a medical device. Uh, we as radiologists who are incorporating 
AI into practice, we are ultimately responsible for the patient care that is delivered, whether it's delivered by a combination of AI and radiologists or just radiologists. So that's our, our sort of um, compact with the patient. And so we are therefore, uh, it behooves us therefore to not only make sure that the AI works when we accept it first into our practice, but also over time. Hmm. I remember uh, AI has been trained on a particular set of data the data set on which it was trained was limited. It may have been just adults. It may have been white or black adults. It may have been old or young people. It may have been any combination thereof. It may have been geographically restricted because the data came just from one institution. What I'm saying is there are certain limitations to the data set that the AI saw during its training. And when you take that AI and now you put it into an organization and let it see new data, uh, the the, the, the degree to which it will work well depends on how similar that data is to what it was trained on. Now, if you keep that in mind, since you don't know exactly what it was trained on, you really need to check and see whether this is in fact working on your data. Now, quite apart from the population-based features of the training data set that I mentioned, you, you can almost be certain that the scanners and the protocols and the reconstructed slice thickness and so forth, the many sort of variables that go into making an imaging study were different in the training set from yours. And so you really have to check and see whether AI works in your practice with your machines, your protocols on your population. And you do that at the beginning of its life cycle, but then think of what happens over time. If you keep this software around for three, five, 10 years, five years from now, you will have retired half of your scanners new scanners will be on the market. If it's CT, you know, you may have changed the dose. Uh, the noise profile of the images may have changed. So you have no idea how that impacts the performance of the AI. So every time you make a, a, a change to the environment in your practice in which this technology is deployed, you need to reassess its function. You know, um, maybe for other radiologists who are looking to follow your example, um, I'm assuming they should probably expect these kinds of hiccups along the way. So apart from <clears throat> the, 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 the training, the data kind of issue or training the software issue you just highlighted, are there any other, um, I don't want to call them missteps, but are maybe unanticipated issues that came up along the way to integrating these algorithms? And, and can you talk a little bit about maybe how you corrected for that? Yeah, one, one thing that comes to mind is um, we, we put in some algorithms that were looking for some fairly impactful diseases. And, you know, we, a couple of technical things needed to happen. When a study of that kind was completed, um, the AI orchestrator, which is the piece of technology that looks for one of those studies coming through the pipeline, that then sends it up to the cloud for it to be processed, that the that AI orchestrator needed to obviously be tuned correctly mm -hmm. so that it wouldn't miss any of the studies. The studies were showing up on our working lists pretty quickly because they were all stat exams. And so what we found initially before we had a more sort of elaborate um, in, in integration with our workflow software, it was that these cases popped up for the radiologist to read and the radiologist had no visibility as to whether this study had also been sent to the AI cloud. Mm. And therefore, you know, it wasn't clear to them when there was no result available, whether or not they should wait for it or whether it was one of those technical flukes where the study did not go up to the cloud. So we actually very quickly um, introduced an improvement whereby the AI software began to tell in a visible manner, visible to the radiologist, began to tell the workflow engine what was happening. So if a study was successfully sent up to the cloud, you would be able to see that, the radiologist would be able to see that. And they could then make a, a decision whether or not they were confident in their read and they would just move on and read, or whether they wanted to set the study aside and wait for the AI result before they did so. And they were also able to pick up on scenarios where a study should have gone to the cloud but didn't. So if there was a study that should have been processed, but there was no signal that was had, had gone up to the cloud, they were able to submit tickets on that. So 
just tighter process control and the ability to know what, what was coming down the pike and potentially waiting for it, altering your own workflow was a benefit. We initially didn't have that, but then when we realized that we really wanted that, um, we were able to develop it with the vendors. Excellent. Well, it sounds like there's so much involved with <clears throat> in this process. Uh, you know, it, it might at the outset seem a little overwhelming. So, for anyone listening, you might be interested in trying to incorporate algorithms into their workflow. What are some initial practical steps that you recommend? Yeah, I would I would say don't boil the ocean. You know, uh, if your practice really hasn't ever used this technology. Uh, you might actually approach this in the following way. Find the most motivated radiologist or radiologists. Uh, it could be the breast team. It could be the neuro team. You know, it, it's, it's locally variable. And then really just focus on one or two areas. And, and because you've got motivated radiologists, they might be willing to then do all the due diligence that's required to get in the game. Uh, I already mentioned uh, ACI AI Central. That's a great place to start your shopping exercise. So if you, let's say you've identified your highly motivated radiologist, let's just pick on the neuro team. So it's, let's say it's the neuro radiologist. And um, so they now can go to uh, AI Central and they can filter by neuro AI applications and they can see what's there. Uh, and they can maybe pick one or two areas that are particularly relevant to their practice. I'm just going to pick one area. Um, maybe there is a group of, you know, neurologists that they service that, that are specializing in Alzheimer's disease or neurodegenerative disease. So maybe uh, they want to try out some algorithms that quantify brain atrophy, mm -hmm. uh, the distribution and, and, and sort of uh, severity of that. There are solutions for this out there, more than one. And so you can find them on AI Central, and then you can contact the vendors and you can set up your trials. And if you're not sure which one to pick, maybe you take a look at the marketplace vendors and see which one of the marketplace vendors has more than one uh, in their offering. And then you sign a contract with that marketplace vendor because now you can do them one after another uh, and try them out uh, without having to separately install them. So that, that would be one simple and easy way uh, to go about it. Uh, one thing I also wanted to mention is uh, the ACR Informatics Commission has been starting to aggregate uh, information on an e-learning hub. Mm. We're trying to keep it pretty uh, practical and simple. So we've been capturing some recordings from the uh, DSI Summit and from the ACR Informatics Summit in 2020 and 21, uh, and have been aggregating this information um, uh, on, on that on that portal, it's free to all members. Um, and so I hope that people uh, are gonna look at that. Uh, you already made reference to the Imaging 3.0 article, again, presenting in a very sort of practical, real world manner, uh, how this technology can, can sort of be brought into your practice. So those are, those are some pointers for, for folks who wanna get started. That's great. And, and just to clarify, for those who may not be familiar with the DSI, that's the Data Science Institute uh, yeah, thank through, you. through, through yes. the ACR, yep. Yeah. And, uh, and um, you know, we, again, I, it, it, I believe the e-learning hub is through the DSI, if I'm not mistaken. So I can try to put up some, some links to that as well. In the, yeah, we, we, uh, have, uh, we have sort of two big buckets of learning. So the, the Data Science Institute has a lot of learning resources that are a little bit more specific to, the, to how AI actually works, um, including some of the settings that you can influence, uh, that, that can influence the results that you're getting. Uh, the DSI has uh, engineered uh, something that's called ACR AI Lab, which is sort of, uh, a rep we have a representation there of uh, online where you can essentially simulate the use of AI in clinical practice. Um, this is on a breast density data set. You know, that's just the use case we picked for the simulation, but it gives members a, a, a kind of a feel for what it what it looks like when, you, when you're using AI in practice without actually having to purchase anything. And there's a lot of contextual learning. So we have uh, contextual sort of information boxes that tell you what these individual things are. And there, there's also um, a series of six or 10 videos that explain some basic concepts um, of AI. So that's, that's one big bucket, um, the whole learning center in the ACRAI Lab offering. And then on the IT Commission website, we have an e-learning hub uh, for AI related topics. So that's another topical area uh, on the ACR website that, that you can explore. Excellent. 
Yeah, I'll go ahead and um, put as many of those uh, links as I can in the show notes, yeah. uh, just to give people a start. So <clears throat> and for my last question, I was wondering, what role do you, looking forward now, what role do you see AI playing in radiology in, say, the next 10 years or so? And how should radiologists be prepared, be preparing for the future right now? Yeah, so at the outset of this conversation, I made reference to at least my personal belief uh, and many of us believing that AI is going to transform our practice. So from that flows that ignoring it is probably not a good long term strategy at this point. Right. <laughs> um, and I say that, you know, if you watch what's been happening to the marketplace, you know, in 2015, don't quote me on this, but there may, may have been 10 or so approved algorithms. Now there's 150 and we're tracking towards 500, 600 or even four digit numbers. So um, rapid, rapid growth. Um, <clears throat> you will not be able to avoid this technology. I, I see it impacting the entire value chain of radiology. So um, starting even before we take an image, uh, I see AI influencing how we schedule patients, how we predict uh, no-shows, how we uh, you know, schedule our workforce to match what is coming down the pike from, from, uh, from the sort of point of view of, of imaging volume on a given day. The next piece is sort of at the at the scanner console itself. There's tons of AI being incorporated by our vendors into the various devices that are being used, ultrasound, CT, MR. You know, there's some really clever software now that's being introduced that can make similar or better quality images uh, based on lower dose, um, you know, CT or limited case-based sampling and MR. Uh, so incredibly exciting uh, new developments or things that speed up image acquisition in ways that were never possible before. Um, we see the emergence of AI and imaging operations, you know, anything from real-time feedback to technologists about positioning uh, all the way to some of the things that I've mentioned already, prioritization and the radiologist workflow. Uh, so I, I think, and then of course, diagnostic uh, AI in the first phase of diagnostic AI or, or triage AI, we've seen AI that has been focused on individual diagnostic tasks, but increasingly we're going to see a shift to more comprehensive portfolios of you know, multiple tasks in the neurospace or multiple tasks in the trauma space or you know, whatever. So companies are starting to aggregate into portfolios uh, multiple AIs. We're also seeing the emergence of quantitative AI you know, whether it's emphysema quantitation or quantitation of interstitial lung disease or neurodegenerative quantification and so forth. So there's a whole host of, of really helpful quantitative AIs that are emerging that are now, if you think about that one, they're doing things that an individual radiologist would be very challenged to do. Mm -hmm. You'd spend a lot of time on image post-processing software to come to the same results. So uh, that that's definitely an enhancement of our work product. If we can, if we can, uh, provide this quantitative information to our clinical customers. Mm, I think that uh, there's also a real emergence of this whole concept of opportunistic screening, which means if you have quantitative or qualitative AI uh, that can run relatively easily on a study that was acquired for a completely different reason. So in other words, if somebody comes to the emergency room with an appendicitis, they're most likely going to get a CT and you're going to make the diagnosis of appendicitis and that's that. But you could actually use that same CT, which has already been imaged, paid for. It's there. You could already use, you could use that CT to then also look at how much aortic calcium is there. Is the aorta the right size? Are the bones demineralized? You know, what's the muscle mass in this patient? How's the fat distributed? And if, you know, there are some early indications that if you, if you, um, you know, compute those quantitative characteristics of that person's body, you can make some relatively specific risk predictions uh, of cardiometabolic disease, for instance, for this patient. Mm -hmm. And that's a value add that's coming on top of a CT in this example that was done for a completely uh, unrelated reason. So essentially, we may be able going forward to extract additional clinical value out of studies that are done for completely unrelated reasons. It has its own challenges, of course, and, and the validity of these concepts needs to be tested in multicenter trials, but that's going underway. And, and it's a really exciting 
a way in which we might be able to unlock more value from what we do. So interesting. And I wonder, uh, maybe for a future conversation, you can come back and talk to us about my, my, <clears throat> my speculation on this is that it probably this technology will not be integrated equally across the board. It'll, you know, be integrated some places and not other places. And mm -hmm. I'd love to get your thoughts on, on, you know, you know, again, speculating into the future on, on um, <clears throat> how that might play into health equity and, and issues like that. Yeah. And, you so, know, so. one, one thing that we really ought to keep an eye on is, um, <clears throat> is the following um, in, here in the U S in most settings, you know, there is imaging and radiology interpretations of that imaging are relatively readily available. Not everywhere, there are definitely challenges in rural practice and so forth. But for the most part, uh, we have a pretty good uh, density of imaging and radiologists in this country. That's clearly not the case in other parts of the world. Mm. And so um, I could see, I could foresee a situation where some of the AI that's perhaps looked at at questionably useful here in the US context will be very useful in a context where you don't have enough radiologists or any radiologists. Mm. So um, I think we might see that, that a lot of this technology might get validated somewhere else where there's a much more dramatic mismatch between uh, the need for, for imaging expertise and the actual availability thereof and it, it may come back to us, you know, after it has sort of been proven out elsewhere. So I think the value of AI should really be um, stated in the context in which it is being used. And, and what we see in the US is not necessarily uh, applicable to the rest of the world. No, it's just definitely something to keep our eye on. So I, we'll yeah. hopefully come back to you at some future point and, and we'll have a whole new discussion about that and, and other, other aspects of this very interesting and unfolding um, uh, concept and, and issue. So Dr. Wald, I, I just really wanted to thank you so much today uh, for the interesting conversation. Um, again, as we mentioned, this is unfolding and it's constantly evolving. So where mm -hmm. can people find you online if they'd like to know more about this? Well, they can just send me an email if they'd like. Uh, cwald at acr.org um, is my, my ACR email. And uh, the IT Commission has its own um, URL on the ACR website. So you can just uh, put it in the search. Uh, the, we've mentioned the Data Science Institute, uh, so you can absolutely search for that on the ACI website. So those would be some easy ways to get either to the information or to myself. Excellent. Well, also, as I mentioned earlier, a couple of times in our show notes today for, uh, for today's episode, I'll go make sure to include links to the case study uh, that, that we did uh, uh, at your site uh, and also the Instagram live conversation you and I had not too long ago. Um, also, I'll go ahead and uh, again, put some links up to the, the DSI and, and other relevant links that, that we mentioned earlier. Uh, also, for our listeners, uh, if you have any ideas for future show topics, I want to throw it to you and you know, please let us know on Twitter uh, and use the handle at radiology ACR. And also please include hashtag ACR bulletin podcast in your tweet. I would love to, to get that conversation going. Um, and I also invite you to check out all of our episodes, our past episodes at Ap Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and also be sure to subscribe to ACR's YouTube channel to stay up to date um, on all of our latest episodes. And last but not least, please do hit the like button on this video if you found it uh, valuable. So uh, again, Dr. Wald, thank you so much. Please do come back and, and uh, talk to us again about this fascinating topic. Absolutely. My pleasure. Thanks, Chris, for having me. Well, thank you. And thanks again to our listeners. This has been the ACR Bulletin Podcast. See you next time.